Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the session. Um, today, uh, for our sort of summer training webinar, we're going to be talking about the importance of understanding emotions in the classroom. Um, it's an interactive workshop, so we've got an activity a bit later where you can share your experience working with a pupil who has characteristics of SEMH. So be ready to share and type in the chat box down below. We're also going to use the chat box for uh, any general questions or comments about the session or any follow up and, you know, say good morning and tell us where you're sort of joining from because that's really nice to know because we can't actually see you all. So it's nice to know where you're coming from. And then, oh, we have a Q&A box as well. So use that for your questions to myself and Lisa. Um, so yeah, Q&A Q &A stuff is for questions and then general chat goes in the chat box. Cool, so um, yeah, let's get started. Um, first of all, introductions. My name's Charlie Pierce. Um, I'm a software engineer here at Zen Educate and I used to be an SEN teacher and a support worker for kids with autism mainly. Um, and today I'm joined by Lisa Thornley. Lisa, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I will. Thanks, Charlie. Good morning and good morning to everyone. Um, so I currently am the SEN consultant for Zen Educate. Uh, and previous to that, I qualified as a teacher in 1997, a long time ago, um, and was a teacher for about 10 and a half years in various educational settings. I initially started at um, Hindley Remand Centre um, in a place called Wigan, uh, if any of you know that. And then I moved on to secondary school, uh, Prues, and finally uh, ended up in London as um, a deputy head for uh, SEN, uh, Inclusion, Behaviour and Safeguarding. Um, and my post prior to coming here, Zen, was I was head of educational safeguarding for Lewisham Council. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be here today um, and maybe encompassing all my experience into this one hour uh, presentation for you guys. So our aims for today. Um, so ultimately, um, we are going to be exploring, developing, practicing, and hopefully when you leave here, you'll have confidence uh, and, and an understanding of emotions in the classroom and how they um, play out in our spaces, in our uh, educational establishments. Um, so basically in our classroom uh, and our educational settings when we explore uh, the emotions we, we are ultimately looking at three sets of emotions in a classroom um, when a child is uh, learning or struggling to learn and their fear shame and scarcity they're the three main behaviors that i will be exploring today I hope that you do leave today with a development of confidence in recognising the characteristics of social, emotional, mental health. So again, how do they play out and how do we um, connect before we correct? And how does a pupil go from um, interdependence towards dependency with our um, nurture and our understanding of recognising social and emotional mental health? I will, develop, will be introducing two models that I have used and uh, practiced myself uh, as a teacher and as a drama therapist. And these two models are the Cartman Triangle and uh, RAIN, which some of you may already be using uh, and teaching and reflecting in your classroom. And also number four, I do want to introduce how government guidelines uh, and government policies help you uh, to deliver best practice in behaviour and of course how it keeps you safe in the classroom as an educational practice practitioner. So I'll be looking mainly at two policies, they're the Keeping Children Safe in Education, September 2021, um, and um, helping to um, safeguard, working together to safeguard children. So they're the four aims. 
So what is social, emotional, mental health? Well, it's one of the four broad categories of the SEND code of practice that was introduced in 2015. So of course, the four broad categories are um, cognition and learning, communication, uh, sensory, physical, and um, social, emotional, uh, emotional, uh, mental health. Um, and social, emotional, mental health is a type of SEN which also does infiltrate in the other three a lot of the time. And so this is why social, emotional, mental health, SEMH, is probably one of the most difficult uh, categories for a child to gain an education health care plan, uh, which is the ES EHCP. A pupil does often show inappropriate responses and feelings to situations. And again, that goes back to the three main emotions of fear, shame and scarcity. This often means that they have difficulty in building and maintaining relationships with uh, peers uh, and adults, and they do struggle to engage. Children and young people often demonstrate emotions of anxiety, of fear, of feeling misunderstood, injustice, which is a huge one for children in particular uh, who have autism. Children with autism are really quite beautiful children in, in the fact that they really do not like lies and they really do not understand um, what is right for one pupil and what is not right for another. And they can respond sometimes with huge anxiety and aggression towards that. So again, that goes back to our behaviour policies in school. The typical characteristics of children and young people with social, emotional, mental health are disruption, temper disruption, frustration, anger, verbal and physical threats and risk taking. And the reason why I've put certain elements of uh, us being aware of where this emotion can result in, such as gangs and county lines, again goes back to keeping children safe in education, which talks about peer and peer pressure uh, and how antisocial and unco uncooperative behaviour can result in children being coerced into gangs and county lines as their um, presentation, um, their behaviours um, basically sometimes can give a, a sign to other young children uh, and young people that they would be uh, a very appropriate to join a gang and county line. However, we know as, as uh, educational uh, professionals that these children are ultimately very scared and very anxious young people. Some of the other characteristics that do show in um, children that demonstrate SEMH are uh, eating disorders, stealing, truancy, drug misuse and bullying. Often a child that bullies is often being bullied and sometimes that can um, project in terms of uh, wanting to be heard. So therefore, if they bully, they know that they will get some attention. So we need to be very mindful of what is underpinning bullying in our school. What is underpinning truancy in our school? And why does a child steal? And why does a child choose to self-medicate with cannabis uh, in terms of drug misuse? Um, and, and obviously sometimes that is, you know, more prevalent in secondary school uh, than, than primary. So the, the first strategy that I'd like to introduce you to is something that I was introduced to myself when I trained as a drama therapist. Um, and it resonated with, uh, with me uh, quite profoundly. Um, and the Cartman Triangle was introduced in the late 1960s by a gentleman called Stephen Cartman. Um, and basically his study was around personal and power conflicts. Um, and the reason why it's also um, used uh, in the term of, of the drama triangle is that often when we see drama on stage, on TV, on film, is that an actor is going through three elements. 
like we all do, uh, three structured elements uh, of thought, feeling, behaviour. And we often uh, fall into those three back brackets at any given time. So in a classroom, we would have a thought. In a classroom, we would have a feeling. And in a classroom, we would have a behaviour behaviour, uh, sorry, and how that impacts uh, on interaction uh, and outcome for the pupil. So this strategy is not just for the pupil, it is for us as well. It's for us to maintain um, a reflective practice throughout our um, professional development in a classroom. Um, so it's really important that we understand our own thoughts, feelings and behaviour and how that can be projected into our classrooms and our educational environments. So again, the three um, main um, emotions that I will be looking at um, today um, are shame, fear and scarcity. Um, and one of the reasons for this is for 10 years, I worked for Bolton Council as a children and family practitioner. And I work predominantly with children uh, within the section 17, section 47 of the Children's Act. And what that means is that it's children who were um, on the child protection uh, register at any given time. And the uh, emotions uh, that were um, basically drawn out of children during these nine month processes of uh, the uh, parenting assessment were, were ones around shame, uh, where they felt guilty, they felt blamed for their behaviour, they felt embarrassed where they lived, and they often felt humiliated by their parents, by their peers, um, and by members of their family. Fear was the second one. So fear of getting something wrong in their home, fear of telling the truth, fear of certain sensory um, environments or so smells and sounds and touch. And that was played out predominantly when a child was removed from care uh, and placed into a foster care. And scarcity. Scarcity is a huge one and something that we often misunderstand with children. Children can start school at the age of four and five, already being brought into school with a scar of limited development. And I think we need to remember that children who come to us that have got limited um, knowledge and understanding of routines, that they are not ready for school, not school ready. They come already uh, with us with a limited um, uh, development and educational awareness. So how does this behavior play out in our classroom? So as you can see, the thought I put at the top is that often a child with shame will often say to you, I'm stupid. Miss Thornley, I feel stupid. And the shame causes that child to focus on the attention of others. So they often they are often the people pleaser in our in our classroom. They're very intense with us. They want to do everything right. Um, and the negative effects of shame play out in low self-esteem, a child going inward, and sometimes depression. Um, and without them knowing that child can actually be clinically depressed, sometimes when they arrive at school at the age of five. Fear can play out in all sorts of ways and fear is probably the one that frightens us the most because these are children that act out. They are frightened of failure, they are frightened of entering your classroom, of sounds, of smells, of touch, of peers. They're frightened of tests, so they're frightened of failing you, they're frightened of failing themselves, they become defensive and they become emotional. So when a child becomes defensive, they can swear, they can throw things, they can cry and they can really shout. <laughs> Scarcity is um, something that we see playing out in, I don't get it, I'm not worth it. Um, I don't understand this, so I'm not going to do it. And that is a cycle that increases negative emotions. Often a scarcity pupil will say to you, you don't get me, you don't get what I'm going through. 
and that impacts on their thoughts and their processes. So they are already entering your classroom saying to themselves that they can't do it because they're coming to you with a limitation of a skill in any particular area. So the next strategy that I'd like to introduce you is something that actually I have only been using this myself for approximately three years. Um, and it's something that I really um, developed uh, whilst I was a deputy head of inclusion. Uh, and I was asked to set up a behaviour hub whilst working um, at a primary school and working alongside uh, Wandsworth Council to reduce exclusions and increase inclusion in the school. So it was uh, an ethos and a philosophy uh, that I embedded across the school where um, teachers, uh, teaching assistants and parents could learn how to support their children to self-regulate. It is a strategy that is used by a woman called Tara Brack. She's an American woman uh, based in California. Uh, and you can go on her website. She's got so many resources, uh, www.tarabrack.co.uk. Um, and she also, she's on Instagram and, and Facebook. Um, and basically what RAIN does is it's a process of combining um, self-compassion, not just for uh, yourself, but self-compassion with the pupil and also responsibility. So we often hear, um, you know, quite negative things around resilience training and trauma-enforced practice in terms of teachers and teachers, teaching assistants being soft. That is quite the contrary. What RAIN teaches us, as does the Cartman Triangle, is that once a pupil acknowledges and recognises their emotions and their behaviour, they become more empowered and they learn to change the mindset. So the mindset of I can't do this to I will try this. And it's really uh, quite a phenomenal uh, process uh, to do. So RAIN stands for Recognise, Allow, Investigate and Nurture. And what we do with this is we would recognise what is going on in the classroom. So we would recognise um, that uh, Lisa comes in the classroom and perhaps throws a bag on the table. Um, and we wouldn't necessarily say anything to Lisa at this point, and we would allow that experience to just be as it is. However, as a teacher, using the thought, the feeling and the behaviour, our thought would be, this doesn't look like Lisa. Lisa wouldn't normally behave like this. I will just give Lisa a couple of minutes or I will acknowledge Lisa and perhaps smile at her. If this behaviour would continue, this is where the investigation would occur and it would be with interest and care. So there's lots of different ways that we can do this in a classroom. We could, we could ask Lisa to hand out the books and by doing that, we could ask Lisa, how are you today? And that is with care and she might say to you, I'm actually not so good this morning, Miss Thornley. At that point, you may give uh, the teaching assistant the opportunity to support Lisa, maybe take her into a quiet space and investigate with interest and care. The nurture is the self-compassion. And this for me is where a really effective teacher and a TA come together and really prove that a classroom is a really safe haven for a pupil. So that is where a teacher and a teaching assistant can basically come up with some strategies to support said pupil um, and also share that uh, with the parent carer in terms of this is what's happened uh, today, this is what we've noticed, uh, this is what Lisa has discussed with us um, and again this is all around um, self-compassion and um, and it's a really it's a really excellent model around self-regulation. Um, in kind um, to yourself. So now it's your turn. Um, so teaching and reflecting on emotions in your classroom. 
I know that you guys who uh, have joined us this morning, and, and again, thank you very much for attending, will do this already. And I, I really do believe that we do this automatically. I think for me, what I'd like you to leave with today is a real structure around, um, around supporting children with social and emotional mental health. We do it because we care. We, we become teachers because we care. But ourselves sometimes lose our way and become frustrated um, and we don't get a lot of support sometimes and teachers and TAs, it's, it can be a very lonely uh, profession. And so these strategies can really help us to remain uh, boundaried and structured uh, for, for not just ourselves, but for the pupils, of course. So labeling feelings, acknowledging feelings, and think about feelings and what we should do with them and how and how we should um, support those feelings. So again, you can see that I've written down here a home school agreement and the counseling and the support. And one of the reasons why I've put this on the slide is that obviously this presentation is rooted in social, emotional, mental health and the um, trajectory of where that would lead us for a pupil to gain a, a possible education health care plan. And as you know, the SDN Code of Practice discusses the graduated response of need. So when we are managing a child and supporting a child with SEMH, it is absolutely vital that we follow the graduated response of need in terms of all the strategies that we use and record them. A home school agreement, uh, an individual behaviour plan is an excellent idea. Counselling support in, uh, in school is also an excellent idea. So think of a scenario where you were supporting a pupil who demonstrated social emotional behavior. So think of the characteristics that I spoke about before. Think about a pupil that you have worked with or currently working with, I'm going to go back working with in September and thinking about the Cartman Triangle, label individual boxes. So write it down on your phone or piece of paper, old school, uh, thought, feeling, behavior. So you may have a pupil that is rooted in uh, shame. Um, you know, I am rubbish. Um, I can't do this. Um, and the feeling that that gives them. So what feeling do you think that that gives to um, said pupil? Um, does it make them feel angry? Do you see a pupil uh, throw a book, knock over a table, leave a classroom? And... So that's the behaviour. So I want you to do that section. And then in the second section, and I'll be giving you five minutes for this. So, you know, you know, don't don't worry. Um, and also don't worry if you don't do it in the five minutes. This is something that, you know, perhaps you could do tomorrow in the morning when you wake up with a cup of tea. Um, and how would you support the pupil using rain? So how would you recognise, acknowledge, investigate and nurture them using your strategies. So what is your pedagogy? What is your style with this pupil? So I'm gonna give you five minutes um, and you know, you can type away in the Q and A um, and then you and I will, and Charlie will have uh, a, bit of a bit of a chat about that. So enjoy it, I'll give you five minutes. And um, whilst people are completing this, um, should we move the slide back to, yeah, back to, um, yeah, the Cartman Triangle or the rain one so people can kind of have a bit of a, have it in their mind whilst they're thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Or, Um, someone's asked a question, um, they're not sure about how to answer this because they haven't worked with um, kids for a while. Um, okay. And funnily enough, 
Lisa and I were talking this morning about something that's happened um, to me this week. I've been having a stressful week because I've, I'm trying to move house and some of the plans and dates that we were given have been changed. And I said to Lisa that um, it made me feel really, really anxious and kind of angry that I'd been lied to. Um, and then Lisa, what did you ask me? You said, um, yeah. And, 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 and again, we, we spoke about, um, you know, we, we, we paralleled it to the exercise today. Mm -hmm. So children with SEMH, they actually really dislike being lied to and they really dislike seeing, um, you know, you doing something for a pupil. So one rule for one and one rule for another. And what we did was we paralleled your experiences in terms of, you know, uh, Charlie is a really chilled, you're a really chilled girl. Really, you? Yeah, I'm usually um, fairly laid back. Very, very chilled, but your behaviours were outward. And that obviously, you know, would have shocked uh, your peers um, mm -hmm. and your partner. And so it was important for us to very, very quickly talk about, oh, well, what were you thinking? And you said, I was thinking, you know, just tell me the truth so that I can organise my life around what is going to happen to me with this move. And so the feeling was feeling of being completely lost and abandoned in the process of all these other people, solicitors and, um, yeah, really so scared. So there was a huge combination of feelings around, um, you know, feeling abandoned and not being heard, frightened, um, money, <laughs> you know, all those sort of things. <laughs> um, yeah, and so the thought was, um, I'm really angry that I'm not being listened to. And the behaviour was, I need to stomp this out and I need to go for a walk. Yeah, and, um, went for a walk. And have a bag yeah. of chips, which is you yeah. and after my own heart. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if, if you've not worked with a pupil that presents this, again, this is, again, like what I said to you in slide five, this is not just an exercise for pupils. This is an exercise for you as a teacher. So, you know, when I first came here, I was a supply teacher in London. So my thought was I was walking into a classroom um, and one of my first days was I walked into a classroom teaching English, not drama. Uh, and there was three boys at one side of the classroom and there was four girls in a huddle and one girl was crying. And my thought, and it was a secondary school, and my thought was, what's happened? Uh, you know, is, is, is this a relationship between the boys and the girls and what's happened and what am I walking into? And my feeling was I was sort of quite worried about this um, because the children had also been left unsupervised. And so my behaviour would automatically want to go into quite an authoritarian pedagogy. But actually, I didn't do that. My behaviour was one of how can I sort this and how can I help? So I started from a place of what I see, what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling and what can I do for you? And it was really quite amazing, um, the outcome. And um, we were uh, studying uh, a text and we ended up paralleling what happened uh, in the classroom which was actually nothing to do with both uh, the, the, the male and the uh, female groups. It was something that had happened outside uh, of the classroom. Um, and it, yeah, so it, it really is a, about not just the pupils, it's about your thought, um, feeling and behaviours um, and how they really do impact. Um, children trigger us, and we don't like to say that, um, but children do trigger us. Um, children, a pupil can remind us of what we were like in a classroom. Um, you know, if we've had a bad, bad morning with our partner or our own children, we can take that into a space really, really sort of quite, quite easily. Um, so that's five minutes, guys. Uh, I've, I've waffled and probably not help you to write at all, which is not a good teacher at all. Um, <laughs> so don't take that strategy. Um, but um, I hope it's maybe helped you if anybody wants to just... Um... There's, there's, a, there's a, quick, a quick example um, 
in the Q&A a really nice sort of thought feeling behavior example um, the thought was um that the child shows a behavior that they can't handle handle a test paper mm -hmm. um so i guess the thought is i can't do this test i can't do this yeah feelings are um anxiety maybe fidgeting um uncomfortable movements and the behavior would um yeah. was slamming down the pencil on the desk vocalization it's too hard i can't do this sinking under the desk um yeah yeah i feel like we could all imagine yeah either seen that or can imagine it or can even relate mm -hmm. ourselves yeah definitely and and again we're trying to move aren't we further towards um a school you know a, a thought a, a thought of a school um embedding resilience and you know you can guarantee in a class of 28 there will be approximately 20 children that are anxious about sitting an exam and there is nothing wrong as a member of staff in addressing what we would do and it's really good to use this i i use this um in in a year six class once around transition into secondary school uh, so thoughts around catching the bus thoughts about walking to school how that would make you feel and how you would behave um, and the year six class absolutely loved it and yeah we did a bit of drama uh, why not but um it's it really is about sort of uh, breaking it down with the pupils so if a child is going to say to you I'm going to feel really agitated Miss Thornley I'm going to feel like I want to kick that table there is nothing wrong with um, if they're allowed to chew gum um, if they're allowed to take in a, a transitional item, especially for year six, um, not necessarily into the exam, but from the classroom to the space. So it's just about, again, I think um, we're, we're probably all singing from the same uh, song sheet here, guys, in terms of it's about relationships with those pupils, isn't it? Um, it's about connection before correction. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll just share the kind of RAIN response to our example before. Yeah. Um, so um, if we could put the RAIN slide up so we can use that as a as a nice yeah reference point. So recognising, I can see the behaviour escalating and it's disrupting the other children. The mm. negative comments are, are affecting others. Um, allow is... I first asked him to try his best and that it was okay to feel a bit nervous when doing a test, giving him the chance to self-regulate. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Um, I investigate. Um, the behaviour carried on and I decided to ask him to come out of the classroom environment to settle down a little. Spoke to him about how he's feeling and he said that it was too hard. I advised that I couldn't help him with the actual test, but I could help him understand the question and take things a bit slower. Yeah. And then N for nurture is I showed empathy to his feelings and just asked if he'd like to continue. He then looked back at the work and said, this is OK, I can do this. Oh, that's great. Really that's brilliant. brilliant. Oh, whoever contributed to that. Thank you. Yeah. The, and again, the nurture bit can be expanded and expanded. You know, the, the, the nurture can be, um, you know, doing some some work with um on a one-to-one -one, you know obviously not on your own but you know with a with the class teacher with the sankar um around what can we do for you um and i'll, I'll come on to that in a, in a little bit yeah uh sentence start yeah so we finished that yeah so that was a really good link um so whoever's just uh, thanks charlie for that um, and the contribution. So these are sentence starters to speak with um, with empathy uh, in terms of um, combining both uh, RAIN and the Cartman Triangle. So again, the recognise is that we gather information. So we may not necessarily go up to them straight away as I gave you the strategy of, um, you know, said pupil coming in, throwing a bag on the, on the desk, um, because you may, what, what's important here is that you make sure you know enough about the situation and that we never assume. Um, so it's around um, recognising. So recognising is 
sentence starters um, and sometimes this is maybe best done with the SENCOR. So again, let's go back to the graduated response of need. So could you tell me a little bit more about what happens to you when um, you, know, uh, you have uh, geography, for example? What happens to you in that class? Because we notice in geography, your behavior is inappropriate. Whereas when you're in a PE, it's certainly not. Um, so it's just about recognising those uh, different uh, um, sort of, I suppose, transitions for a child. So could you tell me a little bit more? Can you tell me what you need right now? So this is a really good question after an incident. So an incident that has led a child to possibly uh, abscond from the classroom, run around uh, the school, cry, um, maybe got into a fight. Um, and that's not, again, you see, this is not about being, um, you know, soft. This is about actually the child listening to themselves. You are giving them and allowing them space. And by asking them, you tell me what you re need right now. They may need a prompt. Uh, they may need a glass of water. Uh, they may need a tissue because they're crying. Um, and it's about you saying, would you like a glass of water? Yes, I do. That's fine. So is there anything else that you'd like to share? So again, if a child has been in an altercation with another peer, it is really important that they share with you what led up to that altercation. So again, that goes back to the Cartman Triangle. What were you thinking? What were you feeling before you hit your friend, your peer. So the allowing is to clarify. So the allowing is to reflect back what you heard. So you allow them to listen to you at this point. So you are reflecting back. You are saying, this is what I think I've heard. So let me see if I have this right. So again, very similar to the conversation Charlie and I had this morning, you know, I hear that you felt like this. And Charlie was like, yeah, that's exactly how I felt. So, and let me see if I've got dry. Um, and what I'm hearing is that actually you think you're angry, but what I'm hearing in your voice is that actually you're really quite sad uh, because I heard you say, it really upsets me when. So when a child says to you, it really upsets me when, um, you know, Ali doesn't speak to me. They're not angry, they're sad. But often children jump to, I'm angry. This is really annoying me. Um, because to show sadness is a weakness. And again, that goes back to a child that um, can demonstrate shame. So the investigation is to show people how we're listening. So quite often in relationships, if we, uh, if, a, if a child comes in and, and we are doing something or our partner comes in the kitchen and we have our back to them, they assume we're not listening. Um, so again, show them that you're listening, eye contact, body language, um, and saying things like, I can see that you maybe are feeling this emotion because I can hear it. Um, and your face is telling me, and also really remember that children, young people really struggle with eye contact. Um, and a lot of this is to do with the underdevelopment of the amygdala, which is the sort of the back bit of our, our it's our emotional sensory uh, part of our brain. And what happens is, and I'm doing this because the amygdala is uh, here in our brain and then we've got the front lobe and um, the cortex and what happens is when we're in stress um, that amygdala overrides both of those so it covers it up so if you think about putting a hood over this is what children do wearing a coat wearing a heavy blanket we want to just hide in that emotion so children very often really struggle to look at you so really I learned the hard way. Never ask a pupil to look at you when they're talking. If they are facing you with their body and if they are engaging with you in terms of listening, they're with you. 
I can assure you. So this is where the nurture bit comes in. Um, and it's really lovely to say to a pupil, thank you for sharing this with me. That sounds like uh, a difficult experience. Um, and I hear you. And shall we try and figure this out together? So again, going back to, I suppose, to my social care roots, trying to find a solution uh, with, a, with a pupil is really quite empowering. So you're figuring it out together. They're not on their own. And again, that goes back to interdependence towards dependency. And that's what we're trying to build uh, with children in particular with social, emotional, uh, mental health. So I hope those sentence starters uh, help you. So another exercise. Um, we are constantly uh, in classrooms creating an emotional supportive environment. We want our children to feel safe. Um, and again, linking this back to keeping children safe in education, one of the things that has drastically changed in the new September 2021 um, is the section one where we really do talk about safety in the classroom. And as we all know, um, the media um, has reported huge uh, rise in peer on peer abuse not being reported in schools and again this is played out in our classrooms so peers come into our classrooms frightened of each other so it's really important that we support um, peers uh, in in school around feeling um, safe and that again links in with your safeguarding and behaviour policy in your school so as a supply teacher for Zen I would definitely stress that um, you read the Keeping Children Safe in Education document, that when you go to a school, you do your research and your um, homework before you go in terms of reading their behaviour policy and their safeguarding policy. So in the classroom, what do you have? Routines, rewards, consistency and safety. Again, looking at relationships, peers, the relationship that you have with staff, your TA, um, Relationships about home, really important, more so perhaps uh, with, with primary, although to be perfectly honest, um, I think young people, they love you having relationships in secondary school too. So, you know, a phone call home, a postcard home, um, that home school communication is, is really uh, very, very effective. Um, learning, so how do we, uh, how do we teach? Uh, do we focus on differentiation? Do we focus on building confidence? And how do we work with our um, TA and our teacher? One of my strategies, um, basically rooted in, in my early days in the prison, um, I worked with uh, young boys between the age of 15 to 21 and approximately 90% of them couldn't read or write. So it was very much around I do, we do, you do. Um, and so I take that possibly everywhere where I go, um, which is probably something that I'm doing now. So I would like you to do this exercise. So I just want you to think about resources and strategies that you have um, in your classroom already or strategies and resources that you like to take into your classroom when you are um, on supply for us as Zen. And how you utilise your relationships and what does learning look like in your classroom. The reason why I'm asking you to do this exercise is also because we're nearly back in school. Uh, sorry to put that out there, but the 1st of September is not very far away. So it's just a bit of an exercise to get your, um, your matter um, flowing again, really, your brain matter flowing again. So what does your classroom uh, look like in terms of the resources and the strategies you use? How do you utilise your relationships um, and how do you, you know, how effective are they? And what does learning look like in your classroom? So I'm just going to give you two minutes for that, guys. Thank you.
Okay. I hope you found that sort of quite helpful, really. It's quite good to sometimes just look at what you do. Is there anybody that wants to? Uh, is there any Q&A there, Charlie, or anything? No? Yeah, next slide. Is this you, Lisa, or is this me? Either, it doesn't matter. We can do it together, to be honest, Sally. Um, yeah, because we've already confirmed that SEND is a definition of SEMH. I think what we want to try and uh, link in to the um, presentation is that SEMH is uh, predominantly seen in understanding autism. Um, and um, as we all know, autism is um, the category uh, within uh, a child gaining an education health care plan um, and can be seen in a variety of um, conditions. Um, and it covers a number of conditions which affect a child's ability to uh, communicate. So we see different types of autistic uh, spectrum condition, autism, Asperger's, uh, pervasive development disorder um, and I think that um, as with all pupils we as teachers and TAs we need to go into our spaces with high expectations and again that goes back to the graduated uh, response of need where um, your school might be very different but when I um, was deputy head of inclusion we did wave one two and three so obviously wave one is your high quality teaching uh, across the whole of the school every pupil uh, wave two is uh, more slightly bespoke so individual work and wave three is the um, uh, the journey of the ehcp so wave two is uh, basically the um, the chronology of how, of how you support that child. But with all pupils, we must have high expectations. We must be seen to encourage. We must be seen that we want them to achieve and thrive. Um, and quite often, um, a child that um, is just surviving um, is really not thriving. So again, that goes back to those three behaviour um, characteristics that we often see and a child that is often rooted in um, scarcity mainly so a child that is um, uh, from a home that's neglected uh, domestic violence they are often just surviving and not thriving um, and so that's why this is really important as well um, I think one of my five top tips would be uh, number one, high expectations, encourage, achieve and thrive. Read the info from the Senko. So there's nothing wrong with you as a teacher or a TA um, if a child is going through the graduated response of need and on the SEN register um, to speak with the Senko. The Senko may not share everything with you due to GDPR and data, and that's absolutely fine. But they can give you um, the strengths of that child, the struggles of that child, and the strategies that they would like you to use. So the three S's are a really good way in to talk to that Senko. Can you tell me about the strengths of um, pupil A uh, and the struggles that they may have? Uh, it's a bit of a nicer word than weaknesses um, and the strategies that work uh, or don't work. Um, so make learning accessible. So look at your seating plans, uh, look at how we stimulate pupils in terms of uh, both um, not just, uh, you know, your, uh, your average pedagogy of um, authoritarian and um, um, call and response, but uh, brain gym, moving around, um, you know, different exercises, music, um, you know, sounds in the classroom. And again, that leads to senses. So we've got to be really mindful of senses, but actually sometimes a beginning and middle end of a class using a bell uh, is usually actually really quite effective. 
Um, so homework, it's really a good idea to print out um, homework for pupils uh, with SEMH um, and autism and stick it into their book. It's a really good idea to email home um, with um, uh, the, the task in hand to call them to speech text um, and uh, speech text is really good, especially when uh, we're working with families uh, with um, English as a, as a second language. Uh, you can sometimes get um, a, another member of staff re to record um, in uh, their native uh, language. Um, and that's really, really quite empowering. Um, and it's really actually quite nice for the, for the child to record uh, the task. Uh, the task in hand as well um, and also uh, some of the things that I know when I've worked with um, teachers and TAs and I've done this myself to actually attend the homework club with them even if it's just for 15 minutes um, sometimes a year 11 lad doesn't like it a year 11 girl doesn't like it but um, you, you'd be quite surprised they actually ask you the following week are you coming to club this um, so it's actually quite a, a nice thing to do uh, to complete the task together in school. And again, understanding the behaviour. Autistic students can often be the quietest and the most compliant in the room. Um, and that's been my understanding. It's a child that um, is not been diagnosed that is often the one that is demonstrating characteristics. So we'll know this ourselves, won't we? That if we're not being heard, quite often we go inward or outward. Once we know what's happening to us, um, sorry to use your analogy again, Charlie, but once you know what's happening to you, um, your partner will be delighted because you will return back to being cool, Charlie. Um, so, you know, it's really important about understanding uh, the behaviour. Um, and however, if a student does present behaviour that challenges, um, so I, I particularly like to move away from uh, challenging behaviour, um, it's not, it's the behaviour that challenges us and them um, to, uh, to communicate effectively with us. Um, and this is a saying for obvious reasons, because uh, it's very pertinent that behaviour is communication and it's always a good idea to ask. Um, so do they understand what I mean? Uh, again, you know, going back to those uh, sentences, can I ask you a question? I can see that sometimes you struggle with um, that particular peer. Um, can I ask you why? Uh, are they overloaded with sensory sensations? You know, lots of children do not like music classes um, and lots of children don't like drama classes. Um, and it's not necessarily the content and it isn't necessarily the teacher. It's the senses, it's the noise. Um, it's the lack of boundaries that they feel that makes them feel safe. So again, it's about communicating with that child uh, and also you uh, really looking at your uh, content. And again, going back to what we said before, looking at your classroom, looking at how you use your members of staff in that space. So are they worried? Do they get anxious when they, they come into your space? Um, and do they know how to approach and plan for that task? Again, that was really lovely how somebody shared with us about a pupil who was frightened during a task. Um, and maybe children go into a task completely unprepared. Um, and as a supply teacher, we come across this a lot because we will probably not be the only supply teacher that that child has seen. So it's about going back to the beginning sometimes. Do you know this? Uh, are you working towards this? And if not, let's plan together. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm going to take over for a, for a moment um, and just sort of share with you something that I find super, super helpful in my classrooms. Um, learning about rain from Lisa really sort of when, when she sort of we first started talking about this, I was like, oh, this kind of does lean into um, something that I've used called the zones of reg reg regulation. Um, uh, it's a curriculum developed by an OT and um, occupational therapist and autism specialist. And it's I find it a really, really effective way to help kids recognize different emotions um, when they can recognize them. They can name them 
And when they can name them, they can start to learn to see them within their selves. And when they can start to do that, they can start to think about what happens to them, um, why it happens to them, and ultimately, what's the best thing to do when it does happen. Um, and I've found this so useful to use in like all lessons. It could be the, the start of a lesson. It could be, you know, not just part of your sort of PSHE stuff. It's, it's a really, really, really effective way to get kids to talk about their emotions, recognize other people's emotions and sort of, you know, consider how some of the behaviors that they do affects others. Um, which is really, really important for everybody, um, not just kids with autism, of course. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really, really useful. And um, I found that it can be adapted really, really well to suit um, any age, any kind of level of understanding. Um, here in this sort of little example, we've got um, an explanation of the different zones and you can see that there's pictures of different emotions that people might be feeling and um, it's color coordinated, which really helps kind of kids to remember um, and to group these different emotions. So like if I'm sad or tired, I'm, I'm in the blue zone and that's like sort of a low place, like a lower place. Green zone is like, this is where we wanna be, this is cool. Um, yellow is like losing a bit of control, whether that's to do with like frustration or worry or feeling a bit like, you know, silly. Um, and then red zone is just like, I've lost it. That's it. That's, that's sort of really sort of stressful. Um, so that's the kind of very, very basics. And then next slide, we will, um, you will have access to this. Um, as I said before, like we're going to send you these slides. So I've put a bunch of links on here to resources that I thought were really useful. Um, and kind of at different levels as well. So like you can make it really fun to learn about your emotions. You can turn it into a treasure hunt. You can match photos. You can link it up to the kids' interests. You know, I've, I've seen um, uh, pictures of like football players and facial expressions and the kids have to like match, you know, the, 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 a word or a symbol to that photo. Um, you know, make it relevant for them. Uh, I think that's, um, yeah, a really, really important part because it's, you know, um, you have to sort of, yeah, make it relevant. Um, so yeah, I've, there's a couple of lesson plans in these links, um, a, a lanyard, which is quite nice because then the kids have always got it on their person so they can constantly refer back to it like, oh, actually I'm in the blue zone, I'm in the green zone right now. Um, and then the last link is a really, really, really useful website. Um, it's called Open Symbols. And basically, if you've worked in an SEN school, then you're probably really, really familiar with these symbols like PEX symbols, which a lot of kids use to communicate. Um, they can be quite difficult to find um, and make on your own if you don't have a specific piece of software. But this website, is like a little Google for symbols. So if you want to make your own resources and you don't have the, um, uh, you don't have access to like communicating print or anything like that, you can use these free symbols and they're really, really good. So um, yeah, like this uh, zones of regulation poster here, you can make these super personal or you can have them on the wall. Um, and you can see here that like, you've got um, pictures of what different emotions look like in each zone. And below that, you've got strategies and tools that people can use to um, help them feel better. So um, yeah, like I said, it's infinitely um, usable in lots of different ways. You can make it super personal. You can just have it up there as a reference for all kids at all times. They can add to stuff as they discover new things, you know, and they can share that with each other. Um, I just think it's a really, really useful way of getting kids to understand what's happening. 
and how to empower them to change that. Um, so yeah, I hope you find them useful. I'll hand it back over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, we hope that that kind of links with all that we've, you know, that we've discussed in terms of the Cartman Triangle and, and RAIN. So I just wanted to give you a, a bit of a stat, really, uh, in terms of acknowledging that when we return um, in September, um, we obviously, we've all been in this pandemic. Um, and yes, we've been in it together in terms of we've all been through it, but we've all been uh, on very different um, ships, as I read a quote the other day. Some have been in canoes and some have been on yachts. Um, and um, this was a, a statistic that was taken from um, the Times Educational Supplement in September of last year. So I believe that when we are going back this September, I think we need to be even more mindful that actually this will have increased tenfold. Um, and, you know, as we know, um, we are here today to talk about social and mental health, but I really am saddened to say this, that the services that are uh, around are so limited. Um, and um, as we read in the paper, you know, in, on social media a lot, um, the increase of suicide, knife crime, gun crime, um, is really um, on a high, a major uh, high. Um, and people, young people are really desperate for support and limited services. So as teachers, you know, and teaching assistants and educational professionals, we are going back in September needing to be even more mindful of who is in our classroom and what support we can offer them. So in a secondary school with approximately a thousand pupils, uh, and again, this was from last September, at any one time, a hundred pupils will be suffering with significant wellbeing or mental health disorder. Now, what that actually means is that they will be diagnosed with anxiety, or a mental health disorder. So that could be OCD, uh, oppositional, um, and, uh, and, and also an eating disorder. Um, 50 pupils will be seriously uh, depressed. Now those 50 pupils will more than likely not be attending school and could possibly be within a hospital uh, school. Uh, but as you know, as teachers and TAs, we still need to provide work, but it's being really mindful that those pupils do not become seriously depressed overnight. There is a, you know, there's a linear towards what happens to them. Hence this presentation around um, understanding behavior and recognizing characteristics. 10 to 20 pupils will have obsessive compulsive disorder. This can demonstrate in so many different ways. This can demonstrate in terms of excessive workload, uh, presentation style, um, eating habits, uh, peer behaviour, uh, and also behaviour with, um, with adults. Um, 10 to 15 girls will be affected by eating disorders. Um, personally, I think that's probably higher, um, but uh, like I said, these statistics are from the September stats of uh, 2020. This was really quite shocking for me, actually, and something that um, I um, really, I don't think, fully understood, interestingly enough, until I came to London when I was personally supporting a pupil who had lost her father and the impact that that had on her in year uh, four right through to year six. And 36 to 60 pupils will be suffering from bereavement at any given time. Again, I think that will be a huge increase due to, uh, due to COVID. Uh, and bereavement, again, plays out um, in many, many different ways. And as we read statistically, um, there are you know, seven stages of grief. Um, and so we could see that from year seven right through to, uh, you know, right through to the sixth form or, or beyond. So the, those are the stats that really, um, for me, I think they're, really pertinent just to have in your mind when you're going into uh, a school um, and uh, yeah and and just thinking about the resources that we can 
make um, and hopefully some of the strategies that you've been demonstrated today will will support those uh, statistics cool so um i think we're gonna spend a little bit of time answering a couple of the questions from the q a box um i think Lisa, I think you can see a couple of those if i'm if i'm right in thinking that yeah so yeah i've i've got one here um what to do if you know a child needs support with behavior but the teacher says it's just attention seeking and to um uh, get you to be with with the child uh yeah i mean that's a really uh, good question uh, thank you very much for attending today and offering this question so again that goes right back to the beginning doesn't it of, of the presentation that um communicate a behavior is a form of communication um i think what we need to do more of uh, as as professionals is not to be frightened of challenging um that was something that i learned um working in children's social care and uh, doing my uh, previous role um at lewisham uh, in terms of being an educational um, safeguarding advisor, you have to professionally challenge um, your uh, your members of staff and uh, who who you're working with, and that doesn't mean you know to be bombastic. That is to say things like that pertinent question. I believe that actually that behaviour is a form of communication. Do you mind if I do a piece of work with this child? Um, and it's about sharing. So it isn't about being precious and saying, I'm going to take, um, you know, uh, child B out uh, and just do this piece of work, uh, Miss Thornley, because you don't understand it. That is about doing that piece of work with that child and sharing it with that class teacher and saying look this is what i've found um and you know if, if if they're a really really good member of staff number one they'll be grateful because you will be helping them uh, to have a better classroom environment um and it, and it's multi-agency working ultimately the keeping children safe in education document and this time around really stresses the importance of working together. Uh, so it's not just in the world together to safeguard children, which is the section 10 bit, but it's about us all working together um, to protect that child and us, you know, in that in that in that space. So I hope that I hope, I hope that helps. Um, oh, yes. And um, so uh, I won't read out your name in case you don't want me to. So uh, but thank you again for this question and you'll know who you are. Um, how would you distinguish between SEMH and if there is an underlying condition and a need for an assessment for either mental health issues or a condition such as autism? Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Thank you for this question. So again, this goes back to the SEM code of practice and your relationship with your Sanko in, in your school. So let's go back to, I think it was slide three, wasn't it, where we looked at characteristics. So there's three characteristics going on for this particular child, let's say, um, and um, they are, they are uh, very low attendance, when they do come into school, they're disruptive. Um, and also they have been um, known to steal. So they've possibly stolen a teacher's phone or they've stolen food, you know, those types of things. So that would be acted upon within a good school policy uh, school that will be looked at and that will be looked at within both the, the two safe, the two policies, the behaviour policy and the safeguarding policy. And um, we would look at, um, you know, the Senko, the parent, the pupil coming together. And again, we would go back to those questions around how can we support this, this pupil. If those behaviours uh, minimise in terms of um, uh, the support that we're going to give in wave two, which is um, emotional support, possible uh, in-house counselling, uh, better communication with home and school, maybe possibly a referral to um, uh, the multi-agency safeguarding hub where they can get some early help. 
that's all great and the child uh, improves and we see less of those behaviours. However, back to that question in terms of how do, how do we then differentiate? So the behaviours are increasing. And again, what we need to socially understand is that the, the behaviour will remain bigger when the child is still communicating to us. They're still telling us, you don't get me, you don't understand me, this is bigger than this. You know, I'm not just sealing that phone because I want a phone, I want attention, I need some support. Um, and again, that goes back to the SEM code of practice where you would get the parent carer in and you would get um, consent to do an educational uh, psychology report. So you get an EP, you'd get an educational psychologist to come into school to um, observe the child in both formal and informal settings. So that's a classroom setting, lunchtime setting, um, recreational setting. Um, and if a parent agrees, they can also observe, an, an EP can also observe in the home, and they can also observe at any outside activities. So, for example, if a child goes to football or swimming, and the parent says they never, they never ever demonstrate this behaviour when uh, I take them to football, or they never demonstrate this behaviour uh, when I, I, you know, when I take them uh, swimming. Um, it's really good that the EP does that and a really effective EP will do that. And then that educational psychologist report will give um, a, uh, a diagnosis. So they will say that this child presents with signs of Asperger's, signs of pervasive development disorder. Along with that report, they then encourage the parents to go to the GP. A lot of the time, the parents have already gone to the GP because a really good SENCO would ask them to do that. Um, and that is how we then get to wave three of the, um, of the graduated response of need, where we're now collecting all the um, chronology, all the data, all the work that the, t that the teacher and the TA does um, to basically write and develop that EHCP. So hopefully that's kind of um, the trajectory of the difference between a child that presents with social, emotional, mental health because of a, an accumulation of things, uh, a, a divorce, within the family, a death within the family, uh, witnessing domestic violence to a child who is then uh, developing um, a, uh, a, an ASC um, that, uh, that definitely does need an EHCP to carry with them till they're 25, as you guys know. So I hope that answers the question. Um, Again, you will know who this is because you've written it to us and thank you. Uh, what to do if you have a if you have built a positive relationship with a child that has a, that has SEMH and has attachment issues, but then the teacher tells you to take a step back, but you know that the child will fall back into their bad habits. What do you do? Yeah, that's a really good question. And again, you know, we do this job because ultimately we, we love it, don't we? Um, you know, um, and uh, we, um, we, we gain great strength in seeing children thrive. Um, and again, that goes back to the exercises and the strategies that I've given you. When we are dealing with children with um, attachment issues, it's very important to understand that attachment, and this is genuinely probably my belief at the moment so again you know you can professionally challenge me on this we don't always stay in the same attachment uh, that we were given at the age of five at the age of 15. we often change we all change we change as um uh, as, as adults so it's really important that the attachment theory doesn't necessarily follow through with the child so when we're working with a child that has social emotional mental health and attachment theory together one of the things that um, struck me with what Charlie said in the zones of regulation is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a child that understands what they're going through so that actually they go from interdependence with you, which is great because you have that relationship 
to dependence. So it's the same as a child from the age of three to five starting school. Of course, you'll see a child that starts school at five, cry, kick out, scream. We might see a child actually not do that at all and go very, very quiet, suck their thumb, want a toy. But actually, again, it's about understanding what that behaviour is telling us about that child. You know, so a child in year six who's never had any concerns whatsoever, by the time they're in year eight, might present with issues. And again, that goes back to what has happened to that child. Again, that could go back to attachment. So in year eight, a very predominant figure in their family, their, their grandmother, their grandfather has passed away and that's had a huge impact on them. So SEMH and attachment, they do often run side by side, but please let's not, um, I think, submerge them both together. We need to allow children to change and grow and develop. And we need to remember that all these strategies are great, but the child is the strategy. They are their own strength. Um, so I hope I hope that kind of helps you with that one. Yeah, I think it's probably also worth talking about, like if you if you're being asked to take a step back, like there's a baby step yeah. and then a big step, isn't there? So like I think gradually, gradually. Um, you can take tiny, tiny, tiny steps to independence that yeah. may take a really, really long time to look like a, a, a step back to other people. But, um, you know, if you've work, worked with that kid um, more than anyone else, you'll know. Absolutely, Charlie. They'll tell you. Yeah, they will tell you, won't they? You know, using that thought, feeling, behaviour, you know, what do you think when I'm actually not with you um, during... Um, that particular class and they might say I miss you miss so what can we do about that then so at the end of the class you might be able to meet them at the end of the class give them a high five they've done it there's loads of strategies I mean someone is just beautifully typed on on chat that our life experiences shape us and they really really do shape us you know uh, they've shaped me they've shaped you um, and uh, and they shape, they shape our pupils, but that is what makes them strong and that's what makes them thrive. Um, so now for the last question, if possible, please, because I don't want to, I don't want to run over. Oh, right, thank you. Um, so why are children in early years not identified as needing a diagnosis until they get further into the school system, as this seems to have a detrimental impact on their social, emotional, mental health? Yeah, I think working within children's social care with um, right from the beginning, so pre-birth right through to uh, ages of 18. I think one of the reasons in particular why the UK don't uh, diagnose is that in the UK we are actually um, really strong believers in um, the impact of home life on, on, on pupils. So it's really important to, again, work multi-agency. So if a child starts school um, and they are, you know, um, what the, the term is not school ready, that can mean anything, can't it? Um, I wasn't school ready at five. Uh, my, if my mum was present, she would categorically tell you I was very sad when I went to school because I missed my mum. Uh, and so I hated, I didn't like school, uh, you know, at all. Uh, but um, I had a really um, lovely, you know, teaching assistant that really supported me and helped me and all of those sort of things. So I think it's about um, really going back to basics, forming a relationship with the parent, carer. What do they need? Again, you can use the Cartman Triangle. Tell me what's happening for you. Tell me how you feel when you um, drop off um, your um, child um, and how can we support you? So again, you know, if a child is struggling with attachment, anxious attachment, that might not always be the parent, you know. That could be the fact that they are um, currently homeless. They're currently, um, you know, um, uh, living with uh, family members or in a hostel, um, 
they are uh, they've already got social care involved with them and the child is picking up on this so a lot of children who witness dv and are subject to the dv really do not like attending school and that is because they're frightened of what will happen to their uh, main carer um predominantly um the, the mother i'm afraid um and, and, and we see that in uh, very, very uh, high, um, uh, low attendance, in particular with children in secondary school that are witnesses to domestic violence, um, that the attendance is incredibly um, uh, high um, and, uh, sorry, low. Uh, so uh, for me, to answer your question, I think what you've got to identify in the early years is you've got to work within the multi-agency safeguarding forum. So you've not to work alone. You've got to work with your SENCO, your pastoral team, your, um, your particular borough, your multi-agency support hub, and working uh, within that remit of early intervention. And again, those, that is all, uh, that, they're all, um, they're all data, they're, that's all chronology towards then when uh, the school decides this demonstrates more than um, just the impact of uh, attachment or the impact of, of um, homelessness or domestic violence or neglect. Then that's where uh, your senko and the teacher and you um, and the parent work predominantly uh, towards um, an educational healthcare plan. Cool. Well, yeah, we better wrap things up here. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Charlie. Everybody for attending. Um, thanks so much for all your input, comments, and questions. They were, yeah, really, really thoughtful and um, really useful. Great to have the conversations that we had. Um, yeah, make sure you connect with us. Let us know how you're feeling, what your thoughts were. Um, don't forget that we're going to send out the slides and the recording to you. So don't worry about that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I'd just like to say, you know, that also if you are a supply teacher for uh, Zen and uh, a teaching assistant for Zen, um, as the SEN consultant, I am here uh, to support you with any interventions, uh, any uh, supervision that you may need around a pupil. Uh, and any uh, any support really uh, in terms of how to uh, speak to a senko, how to get information, uh, and support a pupil uh, in terms of um, SEN. So thanks again, and have a lovely rest of your day. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.